Hello and welcome to the Daily News Simplified. The what, why and how of the newspaper analysis from the civil service examination's perspective. So today, we are going to discuss the Hindu Delhi edition dated 29th April 2023. The important topics which are to be discussed have been displayed on your screen and a timestamping of the same has been provided in the description box below. So now, let us begin our today's session. This topic, none too soon, has appeared on page number 8 in today's The Hindu Delhi edition. The topic is in relation to the governor's power in assenting of the bills and procedures which is followed by the state legislatures while passing certain bills. So the immediate context of this very news article is that recently the Supreme Court has given a timely reminder to the governors that the constitution expects that a decision to return the bill to the state assembly for reconsideration should be made as soon as possible. Basically, this contest has emerged because of the issue which is there in the state of Telangana. So, the government of Telangana has approached the court saying that the governor in that state is not taking any actions on several bills. So, therefore, this is the issue lying over there. However, the governor has responded it and Supreme Court therefore has disposed the petition but it has kept certain questions open that what are the exact powers of the governor. Basically, the governor has dual role. We all know this. One, it is the agent of the center. Second, it is also the head of the state. So that is why governor must ensure a very fine balance being the representative of the center in the state as well as being the head of the state. So what is the issue all about? What are the constitutional provisions and what can be a way ahead? We are going to discuss these dimensions in this topic. First of all, there are two important articles in constitution. One is article 200. Second is article 163 in this regard. So first let us understand that what is exactly the article 200. So suppose there is a state. This state is having legislature of its own. And this legislature can be unicameral as well as bicameral. So basically whenever the bill originates in a legislature and is passed by the legislature of the state, it is then presented in front of the governor. Now this governor has three options with him, which is given in article 200. One, either he can give his assent to the bill. Second, he can withhold the assent and third, he can send back the bill for the reconsideration. So basically when he declares that he is assenting to the bill, that means he is giving his permission that the bill can become the act. That is, he says yes to it. When he declares that he is withholding his assent, which means he is saying no to the bill and the bill will end. The third option is that if he finds that there should be reconsideration, he will send that back bill to the state legislature and this is known as reconsideration. Now, it is the duty of the state legislature that it will again reconsider the bill and then will again present the bill to the governor. Now, this reconsidered bill might be having certain amendments or this bill can again be sent back to the governor as it was earlier, that is without any amendments. So now, when this reconsidered bill is presented to the governor, the article 200 in Indian constitution says that now the governor does not have the power to withhold the assent. That is, governor cannot withhold the assent to the bill. So now what are the options left with the governor? One option is that he shall give the assent to the bill that is he will say the yes to the reconsidered bill. Second is that he can reserve the bill for the president also. This he can also do in the first instance. Important thing here, here is that the governor cannot send bill back for reconsideration to the state legislature provided it is a money bill. So money bill cannot be sent back for the reconsideration. Now. Once the bill has been reserved for the president, then what are the options? 
Now, once the bill has been reserved for the president, so now onwards the governor does not have any role in the assenting procedure to the bill, and the president can give the assent to the bill, can withhold the assent to the bill, and can again send the bill back for the reconsideration to the state legislature. Again, the state will provide the bill to the president, and now there is no bondation on the president that what he should do. But the important aspect when you closely analyze in all this procedure is there are certain issues. One, there is no time limit. That in which time limit the governor has to take any decision with regard to the bill presented to him. Second issue is that no procedure has been adopted to reserve the bills for the president. So it is basically left on the discretion of the governor. And the third issue is that it seems that the governor has an absolute power that whether he can pass or he can end any bill. So now we all know that because the governor is appointed by the central government and because he is also the agent of the center, so there are a lot of scope that the governor can misuse his or her power. So this is all about Article 200. Now in this relation we shall also look at article 163 because the problem at the grassroot lies not in article 200 but in article 163. Now what does article 163 says? It basically deals with the council of ministers to aid and advise to the governor. So article 163 says that there shall be the council of ministers which will aid and advise to the governor. So generally it is expected that governor shall act in accordance with the advice tendered to him by the council of ministers because these are the ones who are elected by the state's people that is the democratic right. So that is why governor should act according to the advice tendered by this council of ministers. But then article 163 further says that there shall be council of ministers with the chief minister at the head to aid and advise the governor in exercise of his functions except so far as he that is the governor choose to act on his own discretion. Further in clause 2 it says that if any question arises that whether any matter was within the discretionary power of the governor or not governor that is the decision of the governor shall be the final. So basically the governor has absolute power for the discretion and that is why using this power the governor can do anything which he wants to do with the bill. That is he can reserve the bill for the president whenever he wants to do. Further he has also been provided with the immunity that the validity of anything done by the governor shall not be called in question on the ground that he ought or ought not to have acted on his discretion. So that is why it is said that the discretionary powers of the governor are constitutional in nature and it is also vast compared to the president because president has to act on the advice of the council of ministers. There is no constitutional discretion given to the president. But on the other hand, constitution provides this discretion to the governor and that is why and that is how the whole issue arises. So that is why in this relation, in the issues which we have discussed, there has to be certain recommendations or way forward. So let, now let us see that what are the recommendations provided by Sarkaria Commission with respect to assent to the bills. So first, Sarkaria Commission says that the governor must abide by the advice of his council of ministers under article 200. The reason being that the council of ministers are the one who are elected by the people of the state. Second, needless reservations of the bills for the president consideration should be avoided that the governor must not follow the practice that whatever bill is coming to him or her, they are reserving it for the presidential consideration. So this should be an exception, not the norm. Third says that even if the consideration of the president is required, then whenever a bill is passed by the state legislature and is presented to the governor, then on the advice of the council of ministers of the state, 
the governor should reserve the bill for the presidential consideration which means that again if the governor is reserving any bill for the presidential consideration it should also be on the advice of the council of ministers but yes there are certain exceptional circumstances which may arise so therefore in those exceptional circumstances if the governor thinks that it is necessary to act in his discretion so there should be some time limit attached to it so sarkaria commission provided a period not exceeding 1 month from the date on which the bill is presented to him that means within the span of 1 month governor can choose for any option which he or she wishes to do further the sarkaria commission also said that there is a general practice whereby the state governments oftenly consult with the central government in the drafting stage of the bill this is a healthy practice and should continue because this will avoid unnecessary conflicts between the state government as well as the central government which through governor exercises its power further sarkaria commission also says that as a matter of salutary convention it the practice should be adopted that if any bill is reserved for the consideration of the president that bill should be disposed of within the period of 4 months so basically it is also now putting the time limit on the presidential assent further this assent should not ordinarily be withheld on the ground that union is contemplating a comprehensive law in future on the same subject so basically many a times it also happens that governor reserves the bill for the president and president withholds the assent because the center was already coming up with this issue on a larger scale so as we know that we are a federal country so the matters on which the state governments have their own power they can make their bill they have been provided with these constitution powers and therefore this cannot be the logic by the president that because the union is contemplating a comprehensive law on the same subject he is withholding the assent further sarkaria commission also recommends that if there is any withholding of assent to any bill so the reasons must be communicated to the state government so these are the certain recommendations given by sarkaria commission with respect to assent to the bills and you can these recommendations as it is in the reforms is asked in your mains examination this topic has appeared in today's the hindu delhi edition at page number 8 as a lead article and as you can read this topic is in relation to the women's reservation bill so basically this topic will talk about the women's representation in the political ecosystem of our country that is why as far as the upsc scheme of syllabus is concerned this topic finds its relevance in two sections one is gs mains paper 1 in the society part and second is gs mains paper 2 in the social justice part so basically this forms the part of society and social justice the author in this article has talked about the evolution of the concept of women reservation in our political system the challenges therein and then the best global examples so in this very regard today we will be discussing that what is the presence status of the women representation in indian legislature what are the reasons responsible for the low political participation of women in india and then we will see that what are those arguments which are against the reservation of for women in politics so let us begin the today's session first of all we all know that there exists a huge gap between men and women when it comes to the political participation and moreover when we specifically talk about the political participation in the upper strata that is at the state and central level there the women participation is extremely low so that is why it is said that the participation of women at the higher level is lower and the reason we all understand that whenever there are elections in local bodies so in local bodies that is in panchayats and municipalities there are certain seats which are reserved for the women over there but there is no such reservation when it comes to the state legislature or the parliament as far as the data is concerned the 2019 lok sabha has 14% of the total women mps that is in parliament in 1950 5% of the seats in parliament were already with women so basically in last around 75 years 
we have just increased our women participation from 5 to 14 percent that is just 9 percent and this 14 percent figure is far lower when it comes to the global average of 24 percent so an important conclusion to be drawn from this is that not just in india even globally the women participation in political ecosystem is far below than men now the question arises that what are the reasons responsible for this so let us see that what are the major reasons first is the domestic responsibilities now women are so much involved in their household core activities for example cooking raising the child taking care of the family etc that they do not get adequate space to raise their voice and come out of the house and then take their decisions on their own. Second reason is which is rooted in the patriarchal attitudes regarding the roles of the women in society. Not only in India, even in several countries, the women are considered as the secondary citizens. There are certain narrow roles for which the women are seen suitable. And moreover, even with the modernization, still all the roles or all the areas of employment or empowerment are not open. For example, earlier women were restricted to the household activities. Now with modernization, globalization, with advancements in education, women do have come out of their homes and are actively participating in sectors. For example, they are becoming doctors, they are becoming nurses, they are becoming teachers, they are also been involved in IT industries, etc. But then when it comes to the politics, still it is seen that women are not suitable in politics. Similarly, when it comes to certain branches of engineering, we generally listen that women should go to the IT branches or computer science or electronic branches and civil and mechanical engineering are reserved for the men. So the point is that despite such modernization and advancements in technology, Still, all these sectors are not visualized with equal eyes for men as well as women. And this is true for the political system also. The third reason is lack of financial empowerment. So this is very self-obvious that if there is no financial empowerment, then how anyone can take the decision in his or her favor? The next point is the criminalization of politics which by virtue of its nature make the politics as the male dominant areas and that is why several women are hesitant to join the dirty politics of criminalization in India. And the last reason is institutional barriers like educational qualifications. So even such factors also restrict women's participation in the political ecosystem. And that is why several experts believe that there should be reservation in the state legislative assembly as well as Lok Sabha for women and 33% of seats must be reserved for women. So this is basically the reservation part. But then when we analyze this reservation then there are certain points which counter the concept of reservation for women as such. So now we will look at those arguments which are against the reservation for the women in politics. First, whenever the seats are reserved for the women, it will restrict the choice of the voters. The reason being, it might happen that voters in some particular area are favoring some particular candidate who is not a woman. It might happen that that particular candidate has done a very good job in that particular region. So that is why the voters love him. But then if that seat is reserved for the women, it will restrict the choice of the voters and will not be a true democratic ideal. Second, it will reinforce the gender identity. So this is a natural outcome of reservation policies that sometimes it reinforces the sectarian beliefs on the basis of which the reservation is given. So that is why it might reinforce the gender identity. The third issue with reservation is that they do not address the structural issues. Reason being that when we were witnessing the reason responsible for low political participation, 
mainly these reasons were related to the present social economic structure higher domestic responsibilities patriarchal attitudes low financial empowerment criminalization of politics etc so when we will provide the reservation for the women in politics we are not actually tackling the problem at the grassroots level we are not addressing the structural issues because of which the women could not come to the politics so that is why the mind can be deviated the policy makers can deviate from addressing the structural issue towards this superficial reform next is the practical issue which arises because of the rotation so basically when it comes to the panchayat elections we see that there are certain seats which are reserved for women and those seats are rotational in nature so when the seats are rotational in nature and the women reserved seats will be rotational sometimes it might lead to a feeling among the candidates that because the seats are rotational so there is no need to make stronger bonds with the region because in the coming year this seat might not be reserved for the women and i might not win so therefore there are certain issues with rotation also and then even if we provide this reservation it will eventually favor the upper caste females why because upper caste females will be in a better position to grab the opportunity to enter into politics so eventually what will happen that the reservation which was provided for the downtrodden section that benefit will not be reached into that section and even within the broader block of the women there will be layering there will be layering between the upper caste women and the lower caste women between more empowered women and less empowered women so that is why it is said that women reservation bill demanding mandatory reservation of 33% in legislative bodies didn't garner consensus among political parties so as an alternative what can be done one make it mandatory for every recognized political party to nominate women candidates for election in at least one third of the constituencies so basically reservation is not given at the state legislature or the parliamentary level reservation is given for the candidates at the political party level second increase the strength of the legislatures by 1/3 and provide 1/3 increased seats by 33% of the reservation to the women so basically the seats to the legislatures must also increase and then out of those increased seats 33% reservation can be given to the women so these are the broader dimensions associated with the women reservation in politics in india so this will help you to write the mains answer if the question comes this topic has appeared at page number 4 in today's the hindu delhi edition as you can see the topic reads last unfinished work of raja ravi verma to be up for public display so now therefore this topic comes under art and culture section mainly relevant for the prelims examination because this topic is factual in nature related to the contributions in art and culture by the king raja ravi verma the immediate context of this very news article which has appeared in today's newspaper is that kili manur palace trust has decided to put up the last unfinished painting of raja ravi verma the name of the painting is parsi lady for the public display therefore in this relation we shall look at certain key facts related to this king as well as his important contributions in the field of art and culture first and the foremost important fact raja ravi verma was born in kili manur presently in the state of kerala now this king is mainly famous for his contribution in the field of paintings he has learned painting from two important people also known as the teachers of raja ravi verma the first teacher from whom he learned watercolor painting was the royal painter rama swami naidu the second important teacher was from whom he learned oil painting from the dutch artist theodor jensen so from rama swami naidu he learned watercolor painting from theodor jensen he learned oil painting so this is an important fact as far as the specialization of raja ravi verma in the field of painting was concerned this king 
combined the European realism with the Indian sensibilities. So basically, he developed the art form which had both the characteristics of European style of painting as well as the Indian sensibilities, Indian emotions. As far as the achievement of this king is concerned, he has won three gold medals at the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893. Further in India, he also opened a lithographic press in Bombay in 1894 and this press was used by him to take his art to the masses. As far as the important works of Raja Ravivarma is concerned, here is the list of his important works. Shakuntala, Nair Lady Adorning Her Hair, There Comes Papa, Galaxy of Musicians, Damianti Talking with a Swan, Maharaj Shivaji. In continuation of his legacy, in 2014, there was a Indian Hindi language film Rang Rasiya. And this king was based on the life of Raja Ravi Verma and it tried to explore Verma's inspiration behind his paintings. So these are certain important works which are very important as far as the prelims exam is concerned. In addition to these works, in today's newspaper, there is an important name of the painting that is the Parsi Lady. So the Parsi Lady painting is also by the Raja Ravi Verma. So these were the certain key facts related to this king from the film's perspective. Now this topic has appeared at page number one. The topic reads, we should fix accountability on supporters of terrorism, Rajnath tells SCO members. So this is the very immediate context of this very topic. The context says that calling upon the Shanghai Cooperation Organization members, our Defense Minister Mr. Rajnath Singh has said that any kind of terrorist act will not be supported and must not be encouraged at any level as it is a major crime against humanity and for this all the SCO members must come together and join hands. Now going by the UPSC scheme of syllabus this topic is relevant from the prelims as well as from the mains perspective because in prelims the question can be asked related to the facts for example the membership of this particular organization and when it comes to mains obviously the analytical aspects will be dealt with so that is why in today's session we are going to discuss this topic from films as well as mains perspective in mains this topic finds its relevance in general studies mains paper 2 in the section of international relations so now let us begin the discussion for this topic now the seo is a china led eight member economic and security bloc these two terms are important in this regard economic as well as security bloc and its founding members include as you can see in this diagram also russia china kazakhstan kyrgyzstan tajikistan and uzbekistan however india and pakistan these two countries were admitted later as a full members in 2017 one important point here to be noted is that one Central Asian power that is Turkmenistan is not the part of SCO. Now we will understand the structure of the SCO. RATS that is Regional Anti-Terrorist Structure is a permanent body based in Tashkent in Uzbekistan. The objective of RATS is based upon the Shanghai Convention on combating the terrorism, separatism and extremism. As we have discussed that SEO is also a security block. That is why a specific dedicated body RATS is designed to tackle the challenges of terrorism, separatism and extremism. The main objectives of the SEO is to strengthen the mutual trust among the neighbors in order to promote cooperation in politics, trade, economy, research technology and culture, education, energy, transport, tourism, environmental protection and other areas. Which means that SEO deals virtually with all the major dimensions at which the international policies are required. Further, it also seeks to ensure peace, security and stability in the region and moving towards the establishment of a democratic, fair and rational new international political and economic order. 
So from this we conclude a very important point that SEO though is a regional body but it has a global objective too that is to transform and establish a new democratic, fair, rational, international, political and economic order. Now we need to understand that why this body is of so much importance for India as well as its foreign policy. The relevance lies in the very importance of this particular region that is Central Asian region which offers multiple objectives for India. For example, energy security. As we know that Central Asian region is highly endowed with energy resources and India is trying to gain access through Chabar port construction in Iran. Further, India also has its connect Central Asian policy. Second, for the economic growth. It is estimated that 40% of the world's population lives in the countries of SEO and they produce more than 20% of the global GDP, which is expected to almost double by 2025. So this means that it offers a huge economic potential to India also. Further, from the security point of view, as we discussed that there is a dedicated body to combat terrorism, which is known as RATS, it is viewed by India as a platform to access intelligence and information and further to use it to counter the international terrorism and organized crime including drug trafficking and resolving the conflict in the instable Afghanistan. Further, this region is also called as the gateway to Eurasia. Experts have claimed that India's membership in the SEO is an opportunity for India to engage the Eurasian Economic Union and thereby tapping the potential of the Eurasian market. Further, as we have already discussed that it is also in line with the Connect Central Asian policy of India, which in turn enhances the status of India as a major pan-Asian player. Further, on the value and principle point of view, the Shanghai spirit. Now, this term is very important and this can be asked in the prelims also. Shanghai spirit emphasizes on the harmony, non-interference in others' internal affairs, which is very relevant in context of Indo-Pak and Indo-China relations and non-alignment values that India has always cherished and upheld. Further, it also offers the platform to engage for the bilateral cooperation with countries like China as well as Pakistan. But then there are certain challenges for India also. The first and the biggest challenge is that this platform is dominated by China and Russia who are the co-founder of the SEO and are the dominant powers in this region also. Thereby, it limits the India's ability to assert itself in this particular platform. The second challenge is China's Belt and Road Initiative, that is BRI. All the group members except India have endorsed China's BRI initiative. On the other hand, India has repeatedly opposed this initiative citing sovereignty issues arising out of CPEC that is China-Pakistan Economic Corridor which passes through the POK region which India claims as its own. The third important challenge is India-Pakistan rivalry. India and Pakistan are on continuous confrontation that makes it difficult to adhere to the idea of good neighborliness prescribed in the Article 1 of the SCO Charter. And the last important challenge is the definition of terrorism. Despite the fact that SEO has a dedicated body known as RATS to combat terrorism, but still the members are divided on the issue of defining the terrorism. India's definition of terrorism is different from the definition of SEO under RATS. For SEO, the terrorism coincides with the regime destabilization, whereas for India, it is related to state-sponsored cross-border terrorism. So these issues are there which limit India's benefits in this body and these issues must be resolved at the earliest. So summing up the entire topic once again, we discussed that the founding members of the SEO included China, Russia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan and Uzbekistan and further India and Pakistan were admitted later in 2017. Then we discuss the structure of the SEO. The RATS body is specifically dedicated to combat terrorism and to ensure security and further SCO deals with almost all the major areas relating to culture, education, energy, economy, politics, trade etc. 
and then we discussed in detail that that what multi-dimensional benefits it offers to India in terms of energy, economy, security, regional connectivity, enhancing the political status in the region and providing the platform for cooperation with China and Pakistan. And further in the end, we discussed the challenges associated for India in SEO, which comes in a manner that the platform is dominated by China and Russia and the other challenges being India-Pakistan rivalry, issues in defining a terrorism which is acceptable to all the members and India's strong stance to oppose China's BRI initiative in the context of China-Pakistan economic corridor.